Immersive simulators are a niche genre of game that throws you into an alternate world with little to no explanation on the specifics. Usually you're told, or not, the aim of the game with a fair amount of ideas of who, what and why you're doing certain things, and this lack of handholding can be stressful for those not willing to learn and explore through continuous trial and error. The core aspect of an imsim is the idea that the player can use whatever they want in whichever way they want in order to complete any given task. Unlike the vast majority of titles with a very linear path, these types of games take a more experimental approach without scripted events or restrictions to the user and empowering their playstyle. Most of the times it can be as simple as the way you take down a group of enemies. Say instead of gunning down anything that breathes before you, why don't you take the 10 times slower approach and silently dwindle down the numbers in the room. Either way, the ability to choose gives the genre much more replayability. You've probably played one without even knowing the genre exists, it's rarely talked about and it isn't mega popular. The most well-known examples of such games are the likes of Dishonored 1 and Bioshock. People could also claim Skyrim to fall under the category too, but that's something people like to debate about, so I will neither confirm nor deny if it is or not because simply I do not care. I'm here to speak about niche little indie games, not rant about AAA games. There's plenty of that on this website as it is. Fortune's Run is a 2.5D boomer shooter mixed in with the unforgiving nature of an imsim. All of this wrapped up in a soundtrack that sounds like how monster energy tastes after 4am. Isn't Starting in the campaign, we discover core game mechanics whilst following a purple stranger for a mountainous planet called Uvardin, which is explained to you as your home planet, but Moza, the main character that you play as, has no recollection of the state that you currently see it in, even referring to Uvardin as a frozen dead rock. This place is Uvardin, our homeworld. It has always been with you, inside your veins. This can't be real, I've seen pictures. Uvardin's a frozen rock. Real is... Complicated? Yes. yes, this is mainly a memory. A casualty to the progress of man. This is probably why we see no other similar species here, or life at all for that matter. From the little information you gather with the purple figure, you do learn that the humans brought machines that tore through the skies. So the inhabitants of the planet kind of just boarded those ships. We don't know if this is willing or not, but this kind of led to them becoming more dependent on man-made supplies. Moza shows little desire herself to escape the chains of a space-bound life. Yeah, I've heard all that. So what? You want to live in a shack trying to catch fish all day? Ah, uh, yes. Technology. Medicine. Convenience. You think we had none of these before they came? She says this as a retort, implying planetary living is almost primitive. The figure before you also explains his similar background, claiming that he worked for the highest bidder, so we can assume human colonies enslaved various alien races for economic growth or some other unknown benefit, with Moza being a casualty of this, which has altered how she sees herself, her freedom, and her entire personality. One of the most notable features in this messy, maximalistic style is the player's HUD. It displays your ammo count, the armor collected, and it even comes with a portrait of your character, which will become more bloodied as you take incoming fire. The health bar is tucked away in the far right corner, and there's even a 3D wireframe map on your left. It also involves three days free of Amazon Prime. What can't it do? Sparring with allows you to learn the importance of knocking down the guard of enemies by punching into blocks, charging blows, and timing uppercuts. Kicking can also be utilized to guard break foes immediately, leaving them open for follow-up attacks or even combos. But because this is an immersive sim, you have the option to sneak past fights entirely. Ooh, play away. Almost feels like you're not dictating my every move for a second there. Life is full of predetermined outcomes. Sometimes it is the journey. The self-awareness doesn't stop there, as when inputting the code to progress through the level, it's written on the wall. The code is 0451, which is the code used in Juice X created by Looking Glass Studio, which is the company responsible for some of the first Imsims ever created, a cult classic being Juice X or System Shock. Turns out this was all just a memory, and the goggles lift from your face. Moser learns the identity of the purple figure before her, his name, Kwansari Nat, but other than his name, all we know is he purchased Moses' life, which is the last thing we ever see before we see him die in a shootout in a non-disclosed location. Nothing but guilt and cycles. I can't hold him. We're not gonna make it 
Seminar. We have to pull back now. This is always a possibility. You can't always write right. Now, now, die, die, die with honor, with honor. Locked behind bars, Moser is given a contract through her cell door, which reads Greetings. You have been selected for participation in the Double Happy Food Industrial Conglomerate Work Release Program. This opportunity for social reinsertion has been arranged for by the RBR Deep Space Correction Serious Offender Rehabilitation Program. You will be relocated to a Double Happy Foods Industrial Conglomerate operating location immediately as part of your duties. You will be expected to carry out confidential assignments to safeguard and develop double happy food industrial conglomerate assets. You will be compensated in sentence reduction credits and a weekly allowance of Bene Zabran Fiat, delivered to your account at the RVR Deep Space Corrections Inmate Pension Fund. The currency will be released to you at the discretion of Star Federation. With regards to your present outstanding debt of BZF, at the current rate of payment, based on your total sentence of 368 years, the duration of your work release assignment has been estimated at 331 years, 2 months, and 13 days, for a total of 10% reduction in time served. If you wish to be assigned a case manager to assess your eligibility for our program, print your name and inmate number in block letters below this line with a dated signature and return this form to a custody officer. With regards, Double Happy Food Industrial Conglomerate Inmate Correspondence Facility. In preparation of the first mission, agents have already disposed of one of the pirates who is heading to the FSS Pinafore, which is a derelict ship which has stolen some of Double Happy Industries cargo and now it's our job to return it. Whilst disguised in the Starbuck, the space vessel used by pirates, the scavengers see Moses' face recognising her from wanted posters and instantly open fire. With an error escape through a hatch in the ceiling and a pod full of dead men, we get to infiltrate the Pinafore, which when inside feels incredibly claustrophobic. But in actuality, it's a massive vessel, even in its abandoned state. The first encounter of another living being is a form that's sitting on top of one of the pylons navigated on the outside shell of the pinafore. And although he's not hostile in any way, he will be the only real friendly encounter that you ever have on the ship. But you can't be too safe, so feel free to kick him into the void. The ship's condition is made apparent after entering as vines are sprouted from the floor, overflowing what was once an open room. You're left alone now, just you against everyone aboard the pinafore, except Alexa. She's here to help you with all your tasks, and you can give her a call if you find out that you've completely forgot what you're doing, which is a great feature, though it is embarrassing the amount of times I had to call her up to remember what I was actually doing in the mission in my first three playthroughs. And to rub salt in the wound too, I was being billed for every call. True UK moment. But at least you don't need a TV license in the New Zabra region of space. Congratulations on boarding the vessel. Your objectives are being updated. Please stand by for further instructions. In addition to completing the primary objective, you may want to investigate the Ops module in order to secure equipment for your mission. Look, this isn't my first rodeo, alright? Thank you for your feedback. I understand. Are you requesting that automated help be suspended for this session? Yes. I understand. Automated help will be limited to mission critical objectives for this session. Similar to Dark Souls, players can leave notes for each other during their playthrough to help them prepare for upcoming challenges. But unlike Dark Souls, you're restrained to using a select amount of words, which is probably to stop spoilers or just writing various slurs on the wall.
Unarmed, you face your first bunch of enemies who will be seen inhabiting the entire vessel, but for now, there's just two plain Zabran smugglers. It's quite easy to rush them head on because the melee in this game feels like playing a fighting game. Because if you land enough hits on the helpless victim, they'll be stun locked into oblivion, leaving them with no choice but to succumb to the half circle smackdown. And if that wasn't enough, you can even get your hands around their neck, holding them helplessly while you give them the Gotham City treatment. Preserving your HP as much as possible will make survival in the long run much more bearable, because although the first room wasn't difficult, there's more factors that come into play that makes it so much more challenging. Opening the door opens up a small side room with a med injection, so if you did take any damage in those previous fights, it is actually kind of forgiving here, but there are only two guys there, so leaving without a scratch is pretty easy. There are also lockers to the right and some pistols sitting there. You can unload these to add more bullets to your inventory. Past this room there was a large opening with four patrolling Zabran smugglers. The way they were spread out makes this fight really easy to get past, but if not planned out can go quite wrong. For example, one of the smugglers will walk from right to left, lining himself up with the other smugglers in the room. By waiting for them to line up, you can take him out when he's in front of the other enemies so you've never got your back to anyone so no shots can be shot at you while you're not aware of it and that smuggler behind him always takes cover behind the table, so he'll never break line of sight. And after they're dealt with, there's actually a guard who's in the corner, secluded on his own, and you can sneak up on him and pummel him without sound. This room overall not only serves as a really good tutorial on how to set up your approach or even how to use stealth, but it also has two key items that are exclusive to this room. This strange cube that has its own altar and has something that looks like a sacrificial knife on the table, and some ramen? Take both of these items for some regen and some extra bit of melee damage. The second exclusive item is the basketball. It's not useful at all, but you can be balling in space, and that's pretty cool. Also, I'm currently in my basketball percent speedrun, where I'm going to take the basketball into the last part of the game, because I can. There are two exits to this room, an upstairs route and a door beside the cube shrine. The shrine door takes you through the sleeping quarters, but the upstairs route will lead you to the first of three mini bosses. Uh, the Zabran Shadow Walker. And I mean, he is the only mini boss in the game, but you see him a few times. He's equipped with a combat knife, and the best way to approach him is to use a knife yourself or your fists to encourage a stun. But he isn't as straightforward as that, as he brought a gun to a knife fight and will not hesitate to pull it out on you when you engage in close combat. In fact, I think he does this to lure you into using a melee weapon so he can shoot you in the back. Because when I use my gun, he wants to charge me with a knife, but when I charge him with a knife, he pulls out a gun on me. Feel free to take the cube exit if you feel under equipped at this moment in time. Also, most encounters with this mini boss can be completely avoided, so it's not compulsory to engage this fight. In fact, both routes lead to the same place, so if anything, it's safer and more efficient to take the other route anyway. So just leave him to rot in his corridor, standing there all edgy for eternity. I lied slightly, because in that hall, instead of those two doors being the only options, there's also a hatch that can be used to leave the shuttle and navigate from the outside but that's way more tedious and requires a blowtorch to be used. So you might have to find one and backtrack a little bit, but in all honesty, it's not really worth the hassle. In the sleeping quarters, there's also your first encounter with a new enemy class, the mercenary, who takes a little bit more damage to kill than your average grunt and also has a submachine gun, who will put the mo in Mosa if caught off guard. Luckily, in this instance, he has his back turned to you, especially as you can line up a nice headshot or even take him out for stealth takedown. He also drops his gun upon being defeated, which is immediately a much better weapon in terms of fire rate, but isn't near as accurate as the pistol. I didn't typically pick this up and much preferred using the knife this early in the game, because when I run out of bullets, I can at least deflect the incoming fire whilst running at anyone with my blade with safety off. And also, you can throw the knife at people, which is really cool, and also there's not much ammo for the submachine gun just lying around this early in the game. Taking out the array of guards patrolling these areas leaves you a few health packs to open on the wall. By shooting, or more ammo efficiently, punching the locks, you can get stims or even just random food and or aid items. Your health is depicted by an amount of the meter that is green, but also your health pool is divided into four groups, torso, head, arms and legs. When any of these are damaged, you will have a section of your health bar dimmed out by a grey colour, and this makes hitting past that point impossible, which is where aid items come in. Bandages and thread, or more established items like staple guns, can easily mend the damaged parts of your body, which then depletes the grey area on that bar. Suffering too much damage to one of those core areas will give you a harsh debuff. If your legs are not okay, you will lose the ability to sprint. If you damage your head too much, you'll end up making YouTube videos in your spare time instead of getting a real job. But more annoyingly, you'll get a Call of Duty jelly screen effect and some visual distortions, making Moses see double. 
if your torso gets hurt at all, nothing seems to really happen, or at least it didn't happen enough for me to notice, and same goes for the arms as well. But I can imagine you get a bit of screen shake or, I don't know, Parkinson's. Food is used to actually replenish health points, so you can take more hits before death. So it's beneficial to stock up on rations and noodles. Whilst most food will restore 20 to 30% health back upon consumption, you can find a fireplace or microwave to cook them, increasing the regen by amazing amounts. It's generally a tactical advantage to know the locations of microwaves on the pinafore. A cafeteria is a fantastic place to stock up. Remove the undesired and rummage through their biscuit tins until you find something good. In the operations unit down the hall, after wading through electrocuted waters, you will find an array of terminals that at first glance blend into the surroundings. But when you interact with them, you can type anything you want into the console. At first I looked at these blankly, really not understanding how to use these. But throughout various notes left by the remaining crew, you can find passcodes and logins. Surely they wouldn't leave their credentials lying around. I'm sure you noticed my difference in mood between the work ring and the command ring. I'm starting to regret my transfer request. Yeah, I'm a bit tired of Wilbrick's rants about the political situation, but they're even more preachy over here. For example, did you see this up a shrine in the recreation module? I mean, I'm not against or anything, but it's just not my speed. Anyways, some of the more pushy ones were complaining about the equipment rationing. They're saying they work harder so they should get the new suits as they come in. I'm just following Zapko rules, so I locked it up and left the key in the officer's lounge and ciao. Put it back if you need access to the armory. Unlike the staff, one of the many gimmicks Fortune Run is very good at is hiding stuff from players who don't pay attention to their surroundings because I couldn't find this vent in my first three playthroughs but it leads to some other areas where you can get you know armor that makes the game 10 times easier and also healing items and secret passwords and just 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 like 50% of the game so open your eyes people the user ddecker gives you a couple of emails to look through and the connection to the mains Signing into the account with the password roly poly allows you to power down the live wire hanging by the body of water in the connecting corridor from the cafe to the operations unit. As we all know, being in pain is kind of cringe, but we won't always have the ability to access free healthcare, especially this far away from the UK. So sometimes you're going to have to survive with what you've got. Have a broken leg, but don't exactly value your health points, so feel free to apply super glue to the wounds. However, make sure not to consume it, as it will probably deplete a lot of your health and probably have increased your chance of tuberculosis. But ruining your ability to digest food isn't all doom and gloom, as you'll get 20% of your focus back. Focus is a feature that allows you to slow down time so you can play shots more efficiently. And to be honest, I didn't find it to be that useful, so I didn't use it probably anywhere as near as I should. To this point, Moza has been mostly silent in her dialogue, when it comes to her past especially. Seemingly, she feels a little insignificant to the whole situation she's been roped into. Posters can be seen displaying her face with the title next to it reading Mausolisk. The true intention behind these pieces still is up for debate, but if you've paid attention to the first cutscene aboard the Starbug 1, you will hear one of the smugglers notice your face and shout out the name Mausolisk before being killed. I have two theories on what this could be for. The first being, before the Pinafore's neglect, she was a high-ranking smuggler or thief on board, and these were used as motivational posters for aspiring trainees. We know this as in our conversation with Quan Sabi Nat, she explains herself as a thief, so it would make sense if she's on a smuggler ship or something similar. Or more likely, Moses' relation to the posters could be propaganda to celebrate her captivity, as the distraught look on her face shows the sight of a defeated enemy of the Federation. It's also hard to say if her face is branded with another mark, like the symbol on her wrist, or she has blood on her face like in the hard menu after being damaged. Either way, she'd clearly been a significant character amongst the conflict, though due to her memory loss it's hard to tell where she currently stands. And even if she is remembering everything that's going on and knows her place in the world, she doesn't bring it up a lot. There seems to be a strange bug where whenever I passed through certain points of the ship, I would get into a Shadow Walker fight, but he would be nowhere to be seen, but his health bar would be there and the music would kick in. Strange. I think now is a good time to cover the available arsenal in this build of Fortune's run. You have access to three guns and a melee weapon, the standard being the Blaztec BL-4S pistol, which is the most accurate of the lot, doing 25-30 to 30 damage upon shot, and the first bullet of every mag will be perfect accuracy, similar to the Deagle in CSGO. Due to the amount of them lying around, or held by enemies, it's also incredibly easy to keep loaded. The RTG-300 uranium scattergun is less common than the pistol, but found in abundance in wall-mounted weapon caches. It's also the only firearm with an alternate fire mode, left click to disperse one shell, whereas right click will fire both, dealing a ton of damage, and this will instantly kill most foes with a headshot. 
the MP99X submachine pistol has the quickest fire rate and is found more commonly in the late game that can be found after taking down certain enemy types. But most importantly, the most OP weapon is the steel combat knife, which is a great way to tear through the flesh. And considering you can rubber band around the place when you get good at the movement, makes closing spaces super easy. The knife can also deflect bullets, because that's really cool, but it can also be dual wielded, which is even cooler. Although you'll never necessarily have to, you can exit the ship at various points of the map via ducks or blowtorch hatches. In most cases I would fall into space never to be seen again and end up on some other planet with a bunch of streamers. Oh my god, a fish. No, do a fish. Joe, whatever you do, see this big yellow thing, don't grab this, right? Because this and <laughs> <laughs> But there is an odd occasion where you can skip out hordes of pirates by going above them on the shell of the spacecraft. There will be some workers up here, and in all cases, it proved to be an easier fight because there's less enemies, but they do tend to be much more mobile, doing backflips in space because they're doing some sort of space meth out here, for sure. Also, remember that Shadow Walker bug I was talking about? Turns out, there's one just chilling on the roof, but he never seems to aggro me. He's kind of chill, so we just kind of played Uno, and I never killed him, because he's just he's just chill like that. You're also able to lean around corners to help in shootouts or stealth situations, or, if you're me, x-ray through the walls to find secret rooms. That easily missable vent I spoke about earlier was easily found after I was x-raying through the walls, but, you know, that's just me being stupid and bad at video games, so don't blame that on the game developers at all. You can also clip through a wall in the main objective section, which lets you avoid fighting four smugglers entirely. <laughs> I love game jank. And yeah, I know it's only four smugglers, it's not exactly like I'm skipping out a big part of the game, but I take pride in the little wiggle I do as I phase through the wall to skip out exactly 4.6 seconds of gameplay. Hey, in a speedrun, that's massive. This was also really useful for finding places that are a bit tucked away and fulfilling optional objectives, one of which is to stock up on equipment in the supply room, which proves a pain to find on its own. Inside you find protective armour which reduces damage taken, but you'll need to find places to repair it when damaged. Up to this point you would have only encountered the previous enemy types, but on the rare occasion you may have run into the brute. He has no weapons and stands much taller than the other foes, and he rushes at you like a 6 year old KSI fan to a prime bottle. It's terrifying. Alone, they can be taken down quite easily, but amongst friends, it's a nightmare. For some reason, the Fed engineers who designed this junk heap decided that there should be high-pressure oxygen lines directly next to the plants. Needless to say, this is very unsafe. Please avoid damaging them or the entire pod may burst into flames. Thank you. One of the other side quests require you to burn crops being grown on board which is pretty straightforward, but it takes place in several locations and requires a fair amount of backtracking to find each of these rooms to 100% it. In one of these main growing pods, the enemy type is amongst three stories of standard riflemen and it can be a pain to take down. Whilst being shot at and continuously aggroed by a brute, it can really make you sit and contemplate why you're playing the game on hard difficulty. If you find yourself getting lost though, you can use the markings on the wall to navigate to the correct cargo hold. By then securing the stolen cargo, and defeating another Shadow Walker and not sniffing glue, the next room will introduce the first boss fight in the game. Yes, I've got to do everything around here myself. Now, Yuri put your son! Monkey, also known as Bleebok, who even though is the first proper boss, is also probably the most irritating. His moveset consists of terrifying you to the ground, then noob tubing you until you can bust into space dust. Either side of the room has a stim pack locker, so if you have low on meds, rush these first so you limit the chances of being instant killed and gibbed into oblivion. Strafing around with a scattergun typically gets the job done, but being hit by a tether is almost always a game over. So watch out for the short animation where he swings it at you. His death grants a red keycard that will unlock a cargo hold. Using the terminal nearby will allow you to power it on and give you a free ride to the zero G section of the pinafore. 
which sounds easy enough, but damn, did I not understand what to do before this. So let me break it down. So essentially, get the keyguard, open the lock on the terminal, now type in device CTL, which admittedly I thought said device sectal, which is like a weird computer dinosaur name, but no, it's just device CTL, which makes a lot more sense. And this is a command you will use a lot on the terminals. If you follow up with a hyphen L, you'll be given a list of items that device CTL can interact with. But to initiate an item, give it the order device CTL hyphen D for device, the device name, and then hyphen S, and then what you want it to do. So the action. So an example would be device hyphen D power hyphen S on. So just do that with the cargo hold and wait for it to start rising. But then quickly, and I mean quickly, crouch and walk to the cargo lift and fit into this Minecraft sized hole that will be lifted out of the room. In this section, I gathered one thing, motion sickness. The camera orientates to whichever surface you glide to as you're now restrained to using iron bars along the walls to traverse in low gravity. You will find a shuttle area that will take you to a different part of the pinafore. Keycards are used a lot here to bypass locked doors, but what's that? The game has immersive sim elements, so why don't you just go ahead buddy and hop in that vent and shoot the door's power source? Wow, I feel like I'm playing the game my way. Apart from the posters and the slight mention of the opening cutscene, we are still not sure how important Moser is, but right but right there on the desk are photos of the ship Moser was on, and the one that killed Quan Savinat. Were the inhabitants of the Pinafore expecting her? Or is this a panic room where the scavengers are trying to work out who infiltrated the ship? More importantly, on the table is a keycard that will allow you to open the antenna to progress to the next area. But as soon as you do so, an incoming message from your automated assistant comes in. <laughs> Detected. Please stand by. What? What's happening? A third party has interrupted the transporter data stream. The sensitive cargo has been exfiltrated to an unknown location. In addition, the hijackers are boarding the vessel and appear hostile. The command center is quickly ambushed, and you can either take out eight of the new much bulkier enemy types, or book it for a quick escape. These enemy types are much more tactical than previous. They can go prone to avoid incoming fire, and are all armed with SMGs that can burn through your HP very quickly. They even take the place of the rooms that you previously fought smugglers in, so regardless if you let any of them live, the intruders certainly spared none of them. A tall humanoid dressed in a crimson set of armour is seen briefing the infiltrators, and safe to say that because of the uniform, better weapons and more in-depth fighting skills, that this group could very likely be a part of the Federation, or some more professional sort of space pirates, or even a vigilante group. <laughs> this is Ansera, the final boss of the level, and the entire game. Ansera has a very diverse skill set. A jetpack which gives him a high ground advantage, a laser beam which forces you to play intergalactic jump rope, and he's even got an alternate firing mode that shoots like most weapons in the game from his wrist cannon. But he's also not afraid to just dive in at you and smack you square in the jaw too. And this is really intense too, and the game knows this because before you even enter the room, there's a little armory where you can stock up on ammo, health kits, and just new guns entirely. And he proves to be a great boss fight too, and unless you have a shotgun. You see, as amazing as the almighty Ansara is, he can be stunlocked into oblivion. By firing a shotgun blast, he has a chance of throwing his hands in front of his face to guard. When this happens, if you repeatedly mash the fire and reload key at the same time, you can wipe his entire health bar in just 40 seconds. But he does absolutely beat your ass on the fucking raw difficulty, so I'll take this small victory. And that is essentially Fortune's Rung's content. There is a demo from 2023 and it has a lot of content in it and unused weapons like uh, sniper rifles and even rocket launches which are amazing and fun to use. But the devs themselves have actually claimed this to be non-canon so I left the analysis on that alone. But it's definitely worth playing and just get a bit more personality from her even if it's not going to be in the final game. The reason I want to talk about this game is because of the sheer immersion it brought to me. And hell, did it do such a good job? How can I tell? Well, as you know, 
there is literally one level. This was the entire game up to this point, and I've still done seven playthroughs of it, and each time I find something new, whether that be a chat log or even just a new vent or even just a new way to sneak around enemies, it's just always ever expanding for something that's so finite. Another reason being, less is more. Moza is a really unique character, and her having such a vague tie to other characters like Kwan Sabinat, or even the scavengers aboard the Pinafore, it leaves so much room for speculation and makes reading into the world around her so much more interesting. But simply, I cannot do this game justice in a video, and I'd recommend supporting the devs and checking it out. And also, I've paid £50 on AAA games and had not even half the fun I had on this. And this cost me, what, £16? And I bought the soundtrack, which was another £8. And oh my god, dude, if you're not going to play the game, just, just buy the soundtrack. Just it, it, It's like audio meth. It's audio crack, and it, it, it turns me on. <laughs>